Welcome to episode 12 of the Monday Night Review. This week I'm away in Cornwall with my family. We came here every year when I was a child from the age of about three to when I was 17 and I absolutely adore it. I still have loads of friends who live here and so while I was here it only felt right to focus on something Cornish for this week's episode. When I see my friends in a couple of days I will be asking them for their local hauntings and crimes and spooky stories but today we're focusing on one of the first places many people think about when they think of Cornwall. So today we're going to be talking about Jamaica Inn. So Jamaica Inn is a traditional inn on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall located just off the A30 near the middle of the moor close to the hamlet of Bolventer. It was originally used as a staging post for changing horses if you were going through on your way to or from London or Launceston or one of the big towns. You may know it from the 1936 novel by Daphne du Maurier. If you haven't read it, Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, then do so. I love it. I read it to my husband aloud when we were first married. I also really recommend Rebecca. They're kind of spooky. And, and atmospheric. So an inn has stood on this main road, which is now the A30, since 1547. Um, the current building dates back to 1750, with extensions built in 1778 to add stables and a tap room, making the building an L shape, which is the traditional building that you'll see in older photos. It's often believed to be called Jamaica Inn in reference to the smuggling of rum that is said to have taken place there, but it's more likely derived from the Trelawney family, who were local wealthy landowners, two of whom whom had served as governors of Jamaica in the 18th century. During World War II, it was a temperance inn, and US General George Patton stayed there with a few other eminent generals. There were a large number of American soldiers stationed around Bodmin, Launceston and the surrounding areas. But most famously, the inn was a smuggler's stopping point with approximately 100 secret routes from the coast across the moor on the way to London. The original inn stood alone deep in the bleak moor. So Bodmin Moor is the centre of Cornwall and Jamaica Inn is kind of the centre of the moor. As time went on, a parsonage, church and school were added to serve those who worked at the inn because it was so incredibly remote. Stories of smuggling and wrecking are tied in with Cornwall's history, but there's a lot of debate as to how much wrecking went on. The inn now contains the Museum of Smuggling with the Cornish coast, the most popular place of smuggling, silks, tea, tobacco and brandy into England and one of the best places to store your contraband or hide from the law was Jamaica Inn. For those who don't know where Cornwall is, it's the bit right at the bottom left of England on the west hand side so it's got sea all the way around. It's kind of slightly narrow so it was just a wonderful place to smuggle to get your smuggled goods in, despite it having treacherous shoreline and areas. The inn couldn't be situated in an eerie place. Bodmin Moor is 80 square miles of misty, treacherous terrain with abandoned mines, prehistoric stones, and is said to be inhabited by many spirits. The ghost of 18-year-old Charlotte Diamond in silks and a bonnet is regularly seen on the slopes of Rough Tor, which is the second highest hill on the moor. She was murdered there by her jealous boyfriend and he was later hanged on the moor for his crime. More famously, the Beast of Bodmin, a huge black panther-like monster with yellow eyes that takes livestock and leaves carcasses for farmers to find, um, is said to roam the moor. Possibly encouraged slightly by uh, the, the Hound of the Baskervilles, written by Arthur Conan Doyle, obviously Sherlock Holmes, but that took place on Dartmoor. The first report at the Beast of Bodmin was in 1983, and there have been over 200 reports into the police ever since. Recently, the manager of Plymouth Zoo reported that some pumas destined for the zoo in the 80s had actually been released into the wild. The zoo was forced to close 
whilst the big cats were in tran- in transit. So the eccentric owner didn't want to give up the pumas to another zoo. So she released her favourite breeding pair into the wild with another male to keep them company. So it's quite possible that that explains the sightings. So to the in itself, there are so many tales of hauntings. Um, we're just going to talk about a few. Footsteps are often heard um, in the corridors. Creepier still is the sound of horses' hooves that clatter into the courtyard loud enough to wake people up who look out into the courtyard and see nothing. This is accompanied by the sound of wheels on gravel, even though it's been cobbled since the 1950s. Also in the courtyard, the ghost of a young man paces anxiously. He's reportedly a highwayman whose tongue became loosened by drink and he gave away the names of his comrades and so was killed outside the inn. There's the murmur of an agitated conversation in an old dialect, so it's most probably Cornish, that seems to be happening in the dark corners of empty rooms. Heavy footsteps along the corridors at night have been heard by many and have reportedly kept many people awake or woken them up throughout the night. It was also overheard by a group of 25 people in the bar below gathering for a ghost hunt. So you think mm, they're probably hoping to hear footsteps, but apparently they all heard them. They all stared up at the ceiling. The landlord went upstairs and they found no one there. In the men's loose in part of the new building, there's often the sound of men arguing. Now, this is part of the new building, but it's actually over what would have been a sort of outside passageway between the inn and the church, where a lot of uh, dodgy deals probably would have taken place. Possibly the most famous ghost is said to, said to haunt the inn is the wayfarer who was drinking ale at the bar and a man peered his head round the outside door and requested for this traveller to go outside. He puts down his full, his half full tankard of ale, goes out into the night and was never seen alive again. His body was found on Bodmin Moor the next day and it's believed that his ghost is often seen sitting silent and motionless on the wall in front of the inn. He doesn't respond to anyone who approaches and after a while he just disappears into nothing. He gets called Jack by those at the inn and sightings of him date back as early as 1911. And quite often, motorists would say that they drove past Jamaica in on a fancy dress night because they saw a man in, in old-fashioned clothing sitting on the wall outside when actually the, the inn's just been as normal. It's often said that sometimes he's seen to be sitting next to the fireplace in the original snug behind the bar. There have also been many reports of a wailing woman and a crying baby at the inn, particularly in room five, but also on the stairs. Sometimes um, mediums say that they see a crying woman holding a dead baby. So they've this woman's always been referred to as Mary, and historians at the inn did some research, and in 1834, Mary Downing, a lady with a good background, took the landlord of Jamaica in, Thomas Dunn, to court to force him to recognise his illegitimate son. The landlord was married with children at the time, so this was quite a forward thing to do, and it must have been quite distressing for the woman in question. Room 5 is also home to a haunted mirror. People have reported seeing the face of a little girl. Uh, Little girls are seen in many places around the inn, but in this mirror in particular, or a woman sitting at the end of the bed. So when you look in the mirror, you can see this woman sitting at the end of the bed behind you. But when you turn around, there's no one there. Lights switch on and off throughout the night. Cold pockets of air are felt. Um, Women who stay there report feeling their leg touched by a small child in the middle of the night and some have even said they've seen children's wet footprints coming from the bathroom across the carpet. Of course there have been loads of paranormal investigations 
you can rent one of the haunted rooms to do your own investigation. And in fact, it has its own paranormal team. In 2017, they released CCTV footage of a phone being taken off a cradle and thrown on the floor. I've watched it lots. It's quite interesting because the phone, it doesn't just sort of slide off. It seems like it's picked up. And there's someone doing the washing up at the time who clearly looks shocked and uncomfortable when it happens. The inn has been added to extensively with the kitchen and further bedrooms built in the 1980s. So if you look at it now, it's quite a big sprawling building, but you can see the original L-shaped stone building, uh, which is, uh, and the hauntings don't confine themselves to this original grade two listed inn. Um, I've watched a ton of YouTube investigations. And one interesting one was where the medium apparently could tell that he was in what was the outside passageway, the men's loose, rather than the original part of the building, which I guess you could find out beforehand if you really wanted to. What I find quite weird is in room five, there's a cupboard filled with letters and toys for the spirits, specifically a child who everyone has called Hannah. She spent her last night at the inn with her mother before boarding a ship at Falmouth, which was then lost at sea. So it's believed that she is the girl that haunts room five. She apparently plays with the toys. Uh, There's also another little girl who knocks things over in the gift shop. People have heard giggling and like they feel a child brushing past them. But I have to say, I feel very sceptical about it all. I'm pretty sure the building must feel quite eerie anyway. Um, A building of that age. It's also got a lot of wood in it, which creaks and a lot of old artifacts in the Smugglers Museum. Um, They have a really creepy mannequin which alone would give it me the heebie-jeebies. So that is the brief history of Jamaica Inn. Go and read the book if you haven't. It's great. I hope you enjoyed our trip to Cornwall today. I love Bobbin Moor. And even though I haven't been to the inn since I was small, I sleep in my grandmother's Jamaica Inn t-shirt that we got in the 80s. I love to hear your favourite stories, so please email them in to themondaynightreview at gmail.com. Uh, Come and find us on Instagram where we are at the Monday Night Review. And I will see you next week. And until then, stay safe, be kind and always check the back seat before you drive.